I want to finish by talking a little bit about durable living by pointing out that the United States has the antithesis of durable living. This is American style suburbia. I see it's coming to New Zealand too. Everybody's trying to catch up because we're number one. If you look at so, so what we do is we consume and consume and consume and in the United States 70 percent of the industrial economy is underlain by personal consumption. And economists are pointing this out all the time that, that we have to keep consuming. George W. Bush's response in the wake of 9-11, go to the mall. <laughs> we need to shop our way out of the economic recession. But if you look at the definitions of consumption or to consume, it doesn't look like it's all that great a deal. <laughs> I don't understand why we so easily and readily buy into the notion that we should consume our future as if that's a good thing for our children. The antithesis of durable living requires in the United States obedience at home. This is a city in the United States in 2008. This is uh, in Alabama. Several people were legally protesting illegal actions by the local banks, and so the National Guard was illegally brought in to round those people up. Obedience at home has been formalized in the Patriot Act, for example. Oppression abroad, of course, in the United States will kill anybody, anything that gets in the way. I, I consider Jimmy Carter to be the last decent man in the Oval Office. On, on a day-to-day -day basis, this is a man who actually had compassion for other human beings and apparently for the living planet. And he's known for the Carter Doctrine. The Carter Doctrine is, with respect to the Middle East, that's our oil over there. With respect to the oil, that's our stuff you're sitting on. <laughs> so if you could just kindly get out of our way, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you've seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. There's no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. I saw it, and I could no longer live the way I was living. I could no longer live teaching the dark underbelly of industrial civilization while living at the apex of empire. Tucson, Arizona is the apex of empire. It's in the United States, for starters. As if that's not bad enough, Tucson imports all of its water 335 miles across the desert, uphill, and open canals. Ingenious. <laughs> that's a durable solution for you. We import all of our food, all of our fossil fuels to keep people warm and cool. It's 106 degrees Fahrenheit. I think that's about 45 degrees centigrade the day before I left. That's hot. It's cold, too. In the wintertime, it gets down well below freezing. So we need fossil fuels if we're going to have a million people living in that kind of situation. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons people live there. Of course, the military-industrial complex, which, by the way, Dwight Eisenhower called the military-industrial congressional complex for the first mini-drafts of that speech. It was taken out at the last moment because we don't want to irritate Congress, even though they're complicit in the whole affair. So it is at the peak of the military-industrial complex. There are big military bases there. Essentially, every Air Force pilot gets trained in Tucson, Arizona, at davis Monthan Air Force Base. And there's a bunch of high-tech in industries and all that. Okay, so there are, there are jobs, and we all got to have our jobs so we can make our money, so we can buy our gas and get our food so we can go to our jobs. If we're going to live in a durable manner, we must recognize that the industrial economy is a subset of the environment, not the other way around. Almost everybody I talk to says, well, we have to have economic growth before we'll have enough money to save the environment. <laughs> but economic growth is driving to extinction all those species that we're trying to save if we just have enough money. So this is us pouring the wildness into the cities and thinking that's a good thing. We must use only local materials, no exports, no imports, no more brand earth, no globalization as we're doing today. We must consume materials at the rate they are produced instead of, as with soils and clean water and fossil fuels, at much more rapid rates than they are being produced naturally by this, our only home. And finally, we must rely on our local human community for support. These, for me, are the attributes of durable living. If we're going to thrive, and we have thrived as a species for a couple of million years, if we're going to thrive in any era, including the post-carbon era to come, we're going to need only four things that we have some control over. We need to secure clean water, secure healthy food, maintain our body temperature, 
at somewhere around 37 degrees centigrade and develop and maintain a decent human community. That's all. I mean, at risk of sounding hopelessly optimistic yet again, this ain't rocket science. We've been doing this for two million years and getting along just fine. We don't need fossil fuels for any of that, you'll notice. How are we doing this? At the place I live, I'm going to focus just on food and community and try to put this within context of Auckland while presenting as an example someplace that is not Auckland. Um, my wife and I share 2.7 acres with another couple and, and the nine-year-old in charge and our goal is to produce all of our food for year-round living there. So we have rather extensive garden beds and some cold frames or mini greenhouses as well as a couple of other greenhouses, full-size greenhouses, and our own bees. The world, and especially North America, are in colony collapse disorder. The bees are leaving us. And so we want to have our own pollinators on site. You've only got nine inches of rainfall, Yes, we only have nine inches of rainfall in the last year and a half. How do you manage to grow all these plants then? We suck water out of the ground using solar pumps. Is this uh, aquifer water? That yes. And is it, yeah, what's um, it, it's sustainable at the level of a relatively few individuals in the sparsely populated valley we occupy. If a million people from Tucson come out there and start sticking their straws in the ground, no, that's not going to work at all. So the static water level on the property we occupy has been at 20 feet below ground for more than the last hundred years. The original well on the property was hand dug to 20 feet. And that's an indication, and it was there for 80 years or so. So, and the static water level still is at 20 feet. So that's an indication that it's sustainable at the level it's being done right now. That assumes no climate chaos that continues to dry up the region, so we only get nine inches of rain every year and a half, every year. So one of the disadvantages of living in a rock pile in the interior of a large continent, on a rock pile in the desert, is that things are going to change pretty rapidly, and not for the better. So we're trying to take responsibility for what we're doing by growing food and by killing the animals that should be killed. Yeah, by our definition of should. We have a couple of greenhouses. This is a little kit greenhouse filled with 55 gallon drums that are full of water and painted black so that serves as a thermal mass so it stays much warmer in the wintertime inside than it does outside. And the same thing going on with this partially subterranean straw bale greenhouse. I'm a lifelong academic so I can't do anything. I mean, when I started this project, I could barely distinguish between a screwdriver and a zucchini. And that tells you everything you need to know about my building skills as well as my growing skills. I really didn't know anything. Lifelong academic. Went straight from undergraduate to graduate to postdoc to first academic job to tenure track job. Uh, we're getting ready to sell our suburban house in Tucson, and, and the toilet goes, Shh, like, once every two days it leaks a little bit. So I decided I need to fix that, because I just know somebody's going to come in and look at the house. It's going to do that. They're going to say, I don't want to buy this house. It's got a leak. Who knows what else is wrong? So I fixed it. It cost $500 and a visit from the plumber, because so I've cracked the whole thing. It's just a little leak, and I, one thing led to another. Anyway, I built this. I built this partially subterranean straw bale greenhouse. It's got straw bale walls. And it's incredibly well insulated. It's got a skylight. I even forgot to put the skylight on the first time. I had to rip the roof off and do it again. That's how I do everything, six or eight times. Mm. So my point, and I do have one, ultimately. I'll get around to it, <laughs> is that if I, can, if I can do this, I can't imagine anybody not being able to do this. Growing food and building relatively simple structures is not something that is beyond the pale for human beings, even human beings this far into industrial civilization. We have chickens and ducks and goats and this year we have some heirloom turkeys for Thanksgiving and we're going to kill them and eat them. Because if we're going to eat meat, we're going to kill the meat. So we're trying to be responsible in that way. 
We have an extensive water delivery system with frost-free hydrants. It gets really cold there, so all the pipes have to be buried below ground by hand with my pick and shovel. And we rainwater harvest off two roofs, the straw bale house, which keeps us warm in the winter and cool in the summer, and also off the old double wide mobile home that was on the property since 1995, I guess. A further advantage of this slide is that it shows my post-carbon transportation. <laughs> Most people think it looks a little small, but I understand you shrink as you get older, so I want to leave some latitude for that. It's not just growing the food, it's preparing the food as well, and so we do a lot of canning on the old-fashioned but new wood-fired cook stove, and we have these solar ovens and a bunch of sinks and a, and a grinding mill that used to be hand-powered, and then I operated it twice, and my one bicep was getting asymmetrical relative to the other one, so I, so I hooked it up with a fan belt and an evaporative cooling fan to the PV solar system on the property. Can we grow food in Auckland? Well, conventional agriculture requires one to two hectares per person, but intensive organic agriculture, which we're doing on this property, can support one and a half to two and a half people per hectare. So it turns it on its head. It increases productivity by an order of magnitude compared to the way we usually grow food. So in Auckland, if you do the relatively simple math, there's about 2.2 people per hectare in the metropolitan area, just drawing a line around it, which suggests that intensive organic agriculture could work for growing food, even in Auckland, the most densely populated area in the whole country. This, however, would require somebody doing something to make that happen. So somebody's going to have to get out a shovel and lead the way. With respect to the human community, I live in this small valley characterized by, and pardon the redundancy, life-loving economic doomers. They see that the industrial economy is going down, and for the most part, they think that's a pretty good idea. I live in what I call agrarian anarchy, which is what Henry David Thoreau called it, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, Wendell Berry. And what Thomas Jefferson had in mind with that crazy little project called Monticello. Agrarian anarchy simply means taking responsibility for yourself and for your neighbors. And in this part of the world, it means taking responsibility for yourself and your neighbors, human and otherwise. Not just your human neighbors. So there's a bunch of people who live here because they like it here. There are some really, really wealthy folks who live in this valley who could live anywhere they wanted. Anywhere in the world, and they choose to live here. And there's some really, really, really dirt poor, financially poor people who choose to live here in dire financial poverty. They could be doing that anywhere. And the reason we have both ends of the financial spectrum represented is that people really like this place. We have a thriving gift economy that that occasionally goes into a barter economy and also occasionally goes to the cash economy within agricultural or agrarian anarchy. And so we have people who actually appreciate each other and what they have to offer, which is kind of fun. If we're going to make that happen in Auckland, just as with food production, we're going to have to have some leadership. This is American style leadership. All these big warning signs, also the bridge is out ahead. So we ignore the stuff that's really important and focus instead on the distracting things that are irrelevant. And I don't know how it works in this country because I just got here 12 hours ago and I'm barely even awake for that. But if your political system is, is chasing our political system, it looks a lot like this throwing up a lot of distractions about the left and the right that are both the same and not paying attention to what the real hazards are. So if anybody has influence over the political leadership in this city and in this country, I would encourage you to grab them by the ear or whatever is convenient to grab them by and get them on board with doing something to create a more durable set of living arrangements in this community and in this country. I would love 
to respond to any questions or comments you have. And again, thank you all very much for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your day. <laughs>